workshop. So I would like to welcome you all at the workshop on behalf of the entire MITP team. And I would like to thank Eduardo and Andrea for organizing this. So um, this is a, a workshop that belongs to the Youngster Initiative. As you know, MITP is an institute where we organize workshops and program that typically run in presence. During the pandemic, of course, we had to change a lot of things. We had to move a lot of our activities online. But it was exactly during the pandemic that we realized that the young people are those that are mostly affected by the pandemic itself due to the fact that uh, there are less opportunities to do networking. There are basically almost zero opportunities to meet in person. So we thought about how, what can we do uh, to, to help uh, all the young generation? And that's how we came up with this uh, new program called Young Stars or Youngsters that is aimed at uh, um, young people. So where students or postdoc can uh, propose to hold a workshop uh, online. And uh, so the idea is to create this extra networking opportunity and to fill the gap left by the um, pandemic. So this is, guys, your space. Um, and uh, I'm very happy that we can provide this to you. I'm very happy that you took the initiative to do that. Um, I think one of the uh, differences with respect to the other programs we run is that these proposals, even though you sent proposals, guys, they didn't go through the, the board. Um, so it's a little bit of an easier uh, procedure, but we see it as a way for you guys to, to train and then to be ready in the future to go with a, a, a more formal uh, proposal with the approval of the board. So um, without uh, any further ado, I would like to wish you a very productive uh, uh, workshop with lots and lots of discussion. And uh, so this is your space, guys. Take it over from here. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia, for, uh, for uh, this uh, brief introduction and uh, thanks for hosting this workshop. So on behalf of uh, both the organizers, uh, Andrea and I, I would like to thank uh, the MITP for uh, giving us the opportunity of uh, uh, organizing this workshop. And um, given that it's still 53.58 uh, p.m., uh, I think we'll wait a few minutes so that uh, uh, we will start on time and uh, people planning to join at 4 p.m. for the first talk will join. Andrea, if you want to say a few words. You already said everything, so that's, that's fine. I know, I know. <laughs> You're so good. Okay, Georg, if you are ready, I think that uh, uh, we might start. Um, so the first talk for uh, uh, today uh, will be given by Georg Raffelt from the Max Planck Institute for Physics, uh, with um, uh, the title Starts as Particle Physics Laboratories, Old Ideas and New Developments. So Georg, when, uh, when you are ready. Okay, thanks Eduardo and uh, Andrea for inviting me, for giving the opening talk to this workshop. I mean. I guess it's a little hard these days for anyone to focus on physics, but let's try, let's try anyway. Um, so I'm trying to give an introduction to the topic and a few things that I found interesting recently or that I've worked on myself recently. Um, so what we're talking about is based the low energy frontier of particle physics. As you know, we, 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 we are worrying particle physics about a large scale of different energies reaching from the Hubble scale to the Planck mass. 
and uh, the standard park is lived somewhere in the middle here. And um, the hydrogen frontiers tested it, accelerators by CERN, by cosmic rays or whatever. But stars are covering the low energy frontier where neutrinos live and, and new particles. And the largest mass particles that we can expect to play a role in astrophysics are muons and supernova cores or neutron stars. They're neutrinos, of course. Uh, but otherwise, we are often talk about axions and their friends, dark photons, fuzzy dark matter, and such things, which are often called feebly interacting particles. So we're talking about such things at low at low energies. That's the that's the focus of of uh, what we can do with with stars. Um, so it's just some historical remarks. Of course, the neutrinos come from stars. Uh, was proposed very early on after we understood after trees were discovered and the interactions later understood but even a very early paper by Bernstein Hulman Feinberg it was understood we could learn about neutrinos from this uh, in that case about the neutrino electromagnetic properties from the excess energy loss that stars would receive and the other important uh, milestone was of course Kriov of Portico Porticorvo who proposed in 1969 that the recently measured solar flux deficit what could be interpreted as flavor oscillations and that of course remained true uh, in the future it was a very daring proposition at the time because the second neutrino had just been discovered and the then the solar uh, flux there was also just been discovered and they proposed this very correct interpretation then later in, in around 1978 when the standard the weinberg wilson axiom had been proposed by uh, they've been proposed as a solution or as a consequence of the Pacheckian mechanism. Then quite a few authors propose, ah, these things are relative light uh, uh, and could be emitted from stars. And, and so these are so the, uh, the, the papers are the mother of all of what came later in terms of uh, stars as part of these laboratories, which since that time has become a bit of an of industry. Um, so which stars is one using or, or, or what do, Many people in the audience maybe know about may, may know more about particles than about stars. So let's briefly see what we're talking about. So stars form, let's say, from the condensation of stellar clouds um, uh, of dust and, and, and molecular material, and can condense to a small star, small being less than eight solar masses, uh, which later developed to become a red giant, and then in the course of evolution, uh, will actually shed most of its envelope in an event called planetary nebula formation. Uh, in, in the center remains a, a compact remnant of white dwarf, mostly consisting of carbon oxygen, which is about uh, half a solar mass, typically maybe at the size of the Earth, roughly speaking. If the star is more heavy, um, it will undergo many burning phases as well, but in the end collapse to form um, a, a neutral star, but in the event um, produces an explosion, a so-called corpuscular explosion, leaving behind a neutron star with a mass of one to two solar masses and the size of a city. Um, or it can turn into a black hole with a branching ratio of maybe 25%, that's not exactly known, but a significant fraction will turn to, to black holes, um, which also um, play an, an interesting role in astroparticle physics. So the, um, the surface temperature of these stars is somewhere in the electron volt range infrared to UV or something. The inner temperatures are in the KeV or multi-KV range. The surface temperature can be KVs even for neutron stars, X-rays, but overall we're talking about very low energies. Uh, the highest energies in stars we can consider are maybe 30 MeV in a supernova core, but that's the range of energies and masses for particles that we are interested in in this game. Heavier stuff is kind of uh, the realm of a different branch of investigation. And, oops, and there have been um, a huge number of different arguments, uh, you know, about direct uh, direct search from solar particles. Various uh, bits and pieces of stellar evolution have been used in the observables to uh, to constrain particles or to aim for detection. Uh, so I just list here a few things that that, that came to my mind. Uh, it's probably incomplete, and we look here in a few of these um, of these ideas that tell us something about particles from from stars um, so let's begin with particles from the sun uh, which is of course the oldest and maybe still most important topic because it allows us maybe to detect something new of course solar neutrinos have been good for two Nobel prizes um, for their detection in the first place and for manifesting flavor oscillations 
And uh, the, solar, the sun is still a very important source for maybe detecting axions in future. And there exist very important limits from the direct search experiments. And uh, other things have come around. For example, recently there was this celebrated excess of events in the XM1 turned up better experiment, and it was attributed potential on solar axions, although it was quickly realized that that cannot be the explanation because the other constraints are just too, 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 too restrictive. So I'm not, I'm not going to talk much about, about that topic, but let me say a few words about solar neutrinos and, um, and solar axions. Um, so one, one uh, headline result that was recently in the literature that many of you may have missed because it's maybe not directly your interest is the, um, the Borixino observation of the solar neutrinos from the CNO hydrogen fusion cycle. So this was in a nature cover story not, not very long ago. So what is, what is, what is that story all, all about? Um, so the sun produces hydrogen by, uh, by burning, uh, uh, produces energy by burning hydrogen to helium. Uh, and that can go through different burning chains and cycles. So it can go through what's called PP1 chains, where just protons are fused to form finally helium, or it can go through the CNO cycle, where carbon, oxygen, nitrogen go, in, go around and around and around, and you add hydrogen, uh, protons, more and more and more, and in the end, spin off uh, a helium nucleus, and that's how it produces helium in the catalytic way. And, and these things are a very steep function of temperature. So uh, in the sun, actually, PP cycles dominate by about 98% or so, with the CNO cycle dominates in, in hotter stars. So most of the energy that powers stars is made by CNO cycle, not the PP chain, but it's never been directly measured. And so um, you see the, um, the, the PP um, um, chain neutrinos, which are often shown in this famous plot with PP and all the other uh, neutrino sources shown in blue here, the spectrum uh, uh, of the sun, uh, which are now so well measured that you couldn't show the error bar within the line width of, of, of these, the picture here, whereas the uh, CNO neutrinos shown orange here have large uncertainties as far, as far as the predictions are concerned and have never been, had never been measured before. Um, they're relatively uncertain because we don't know very well how much CNO is actually in the sun. And there's some uh, uncertainty about this question, how much metals, as we say, is in the sun. And um, so Borixino recently measured, measured this flux for the first time. Um, so what the measure is the electron re recoil from, from neutrinos. So these, these spectra were smeared out. So this red line here would be the spectrum of CNO neutrinos that one should have observed. Whereas this black line here is all is 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 is, is the real measurement, including all the background. So here the region, region of interest, but has a huge background. What has to subtract a huge background is to be well understood. And the main achievement was to really control the background so well that with confidence one can measure this this red line against the background of that of that of those black dots. And that's that's been achieved by by many tricks, including thermal insulation of the detector. So it would be thermal flows that that mix around the the lead and and uh, and, and bismuth and so on so this has been achieved but borxino is now at the end of its life and is now being uh, decommissioned so that was it for borxino but it has been a fantastic experiment for um for solar neutrino spectroscopy okay let's turn to the second class of solar neutrinos that have not they're not being recognized often by many people, which is that the sun not only produces from neutrinos by nuclear reactions, these are the well-known uh, solar neutrinos, but also by thermal processes, such as, for example, photo production where photon hits an electron comes between the air, or plasmon decay, a very intriguing process that means a photon decays into a neutrino pair through an effective electron loop uh, of electrons, so a process that could not occur in vacuum. Um, so these processes are what, what generates neutrinos in many stars, in, in all stars, really, except in the sun, we have this additional nuclear, nuclear flux that dominates because of, of its large energies can be more easily detected. And so recently, our chairman um, has uh, calculated this flux in, in more detail and produced this, um, this uh, what, what, what he calls the grand unified neutrino spectrum where we see the, the, the neutrino flux at Earth as a function of energy reaching from, uh, from the, from the uh, uh, microelectron volt range where the cosmic background, the bang neutrinos live, all the way to the highest energies from cosmic rays. 
And so in the middle, we have the solar neutrinos in the NEV range from G neutrinos reactors and so on. We will later also look at these diffuse supernova neutrinos from all core collapse supernova in the universe. And here in the middle part, there was used also that gap that seemed to be nothing. But of course, it's the th solar thermal neutrinos in this KV range that fill that gap. If they can ever be discovered, detected, that is another question, but at least they're there. And I, I think it's a, it's a fact worth knowing um, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, worth paying attention to. Maybe somebody has a smart idea of, of how to detect these solar thermal neutrinos. Okay. But now we have already mentioned that, that the sun emits the solar neutrinos in with KEV energies, which of course corresponds to the temperatures in the solar interior, which are extra energies, KEV energies. And, um, and one can use this also to discover or look for axions. Now the sun as an axion source, that's also an, an, an idea that goes back a very long time. So the idea that stars could emit axions or axion-like particles, which couple to two photons by a verdict like this, uh, was first investigated by these authors. It was Rocky Corp's PhD work, actually, if you know Rocky Corp, the cos cosmologist. Um, and, um, and so they were one of the first to propose this, this phenomenon. Later, we got these invisible axions uh, with much smaller masses and much weaker interactions. And then uh, in interstellar plasma, the screening effects in the, such reactions in the plasma play an important role. And that, in turn, was part of my PhD thesis. Um, in a, a long time ago, um, and, and, and these results are still used today, so that makes me very happy that my PhD work still plays some direct role in some people's experiments. Um, so I can happily retire soon. Um, but the real, the real crucial interest in, in, in these questions is because these axioms can be detected um, by direct search experiments. And these ideas were proposed by Pierre Zikivi in the seminal paper in, in, in uh, 1983, where he said, we could, we could detect axions by this two photon vertex, essentially by converting them to photons in an external magnetic field. The basic idea is that the weakness of, of interaction can be sort of overcome by having this huge volume of B field, which kind of coherently acts. So you have a big, vo a a big volume, uh, kind of cancels the, the small interaction strength, and so you can get a, a reasonable detection rate. And as far as the sun is concerned, you can get these axions from this Primakov effect in the, in the sun, then flies, and then you have a, a big magnet, and the axions can convert to X-rays, which can then be detected at Earth. Um, and, and, and these ideas have been pursued um, um, ever since uh, by, by several groups. In, um, in particular, um, so we can point, uh, or to point a magnet at the sun, it, there was a very early experiment in 92, where it's just a fixed magnet where the sun would come by once and could have put a very poor limit on the, uh, at first, but still very poor limit on the interaction strength. And then there was a Tokyo helioscope, uh, a steerable, a map that they could follow the sun and therefore accrue more observation time. So that's in the base, they do it in the basement um, of the University of Tokyo on the central city campus. Um, and, and that took data. Um, and then there was the cast experiments, experiment of which I was a member for many years uh, from 1998 till, until recently. That too has just been closed down uh, for good now. And it's, it's the huge LHC test magnet. Uh, 10 meters long that, that, that was mounted so it could follow the, the sun and, um, and uh, has pro provided uh, these benchmark limits on the axon photon coupling strength by unfortunately not observing axions. In fact, you can find a movie of, about this on, uh, uh, on YouTube. Well, I, I try to click it, but I, my upload speed is very slow. You will, not see, you will not see it very well, I'm afraid, but we still try. Um, um, let's see. Oh, you can see a little bit. So it's 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 really impressive um, how, how how the thing can follow the sun and and, and take data. Uh, so you can look at the full movie at, at some later time. But it's it's, it's been a fantastic fantastic uh, experiment in a, in a way the um, epitome of of astroparticle physics. When uh, now how to get rid of this? So. Okay, hard to get rid of the YouTube movie. 
Um, so, uh, so I mean, this thing I think should be should be part of the science museum. It's such a fantastic astro particle experiment when a piece of LHC equipment was used to look at the, at the sun to look for new particles. I think it's absolutely fantastic. But it's not the end of the story. Um, ah, there's another little point which I want to make in this context, which always uh, I was uh, very concerned about for a while. The question is, when you look at the sun to look for axions, where should you, where should you look at? So, so the point is you should not look at the sun, because uh, the sun here, for example, at, at near sunset, when you see it here, because by refraction, the atmosphere is actually about a solar di diameter below. So when you see the sun touching the horizon from above, the real sun is touching it from below at that point. Um, so, so one has to be very careful where one points points the experiment. So actually, would see axial coming from the sun. Uh, so the visual sun would be the wrong place, wrong place to look. I find that a, a sort of curious, a curious uh, fact about refraction in the atmosphere. Um, but in any case, um, in, in in the near future, one will one will look for for this with much bigger experiments. The ultimate goal is what's called the International Axial Observatory. That gigantic. Uh, proposal here's a, a person for for size comparison which is essentially bigger and better than than cast and could actually probe real axial parameter space in this usual plot of axial mass versus coupling strength it could actually it, it, it is in a real position to detect axions not just to set limits so what is what's being looked for is real there's real discovery potential which i find particularly intriguing about this experiment and, but before getting there, a, a prototype is being built called Baby Axo that's being built at DAISY in Hamburg and should take up operation in, in, in 2024, perhaps. Some of the parts are, are already there being, being, put, being put together. So you should uh, watch out for this in, in the future. And another, another idea which has to do with, um, with uh, conversion of axions in magnetic fields is one to convert dark matter axions in, in the magnetic field of pulsars, where the dark matter axons are accreted uh, and then produce a very narrow radio line. Now, this idea was first proposed by Schirker and Popov a few years ago, and very recently, there have been many recent papers, including first observational papers. And people have several talks by several, by several speakers in the next few days about this. So I'm just mentioning this as another example of this original Sikiri idea of magnetic field-induced conversion of axions to detect them. Um, uh, in this case, axion dark matter. Okay, let me let me go to my next topic. We talked a lot a lot about the sun, a uh, small star as a source, but let's go now to something which is a little bit more interesting astrophysically, in the sense where we can use the stars themselves as a as a laboratory or, or as an indication for uh, what particles might 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 do to them. In particular, we look at this at, at this transition from from red giants to to white dwarf and see what we can learn. From this, um, from this evolution and what, how we can observe it. So the idea is that we can learn about the stellar evolution by looking in particular at globular clusters. The globular cluster is a, is a collection of, of gravitational bound stars, about a million stars maybe, and there are about 150 globular clusters in the galaxy. So it's this association of stars, here's the one called M55. And if one organizes these stars on a plot like this, where the color, color is on the horizontal axis, or the temp surface temperature, as you could say, at the luminosity of the vertical axis, one gets this very distinct uh, diagram called a Hertzsprung Russell diagram that tells, uh, tells us a huge amount about elementary particles, as you as we will see in a moment. So what we're seeing here on this on this plot on the right hand side is something like this, essentially the color on the horizontal axis, hot uh, on the left, cold on, on cold right on the right, and the and on the vertical axis, the, the, the overall luminosity. And so what we're seeing here is the main sequence stars here, which are the stars like our sun that burn hydrogen in the centers. And, and this main sequence should be much longer, but all the stars with larger masses have, have already finished. And in this global cluster, there's no gas, so there's no new star formation. So that, that main sequence turn off here uh, marks, the, um, marks the end of all, all the, uh, the, the largest mass of stars that have, that have survived the Hubble, Hubble time, essentially. And then the stars, uh, when hydrogen is exhausted, have this develop this helium core, which is the generate first, and then climb up what's called the red giant branch. They develop this huge envelope of hydrogen, can become very red and very, very luminous, driven by the gravitational field at the surface of this the giant helium core, which is very small. It's like a white dwarf, essentially. It's, this thing has it's the size of the Earth, really, and not the size of the sun. Um, and then once it reaches the tip of the giant branch, helium ignites 
and then star makes a transition to form the helium burning configuration with, with two burning sources, helium and hydrogen burning in the shell, but it's dimmer. Um, so it, it comes to this place called the horizontal branch where it burns happily helium in its center until that is burned out. And then it gets this carbon oxygen core, again, basically a white dwarf, the size of the earth in the center. Then it climbs up the red giant branch again, that's often called the asymptotic giant branch. And then it loses its envelope in this impressive planetary nebula events that I showed a nice picture of before. And, and, and then we find the back, the core we find back, that core we find it back at, as, as a white dwarf in this, in, in, in this position, which is very hot, it's called white, but very, very dim because it's very small, there's very little radiating surface. So these white dwarfs are very dim, but very hot, as one finds them down here in this region of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So how can we learn something about particles from such a diagram? Well, that's very easy. Uh, let's say these particles are emitted from the helium burning core of these stars. What that means is that the core burns faster. It has to emit, um, it has to produce more energy um, to, to supply the energy for the axions that come out or the particles. And then you would see in the end fewer horizontal branch stars. They go faster through that phase. So you see fewer of them in the given global cluster compared to other phases. And by that comparison, we can easily get a very good limit on the on these coupling strength, but I'm not talking about this here. And the other idea is that you lose a lot of energy on the tip of the giant branch from the degenerate configuration, like a white dwarf. And then you cool the helium core and it doesn't get hot enough at first to ignite helium. So it takes, it has become more compact, more massive to ignite helium. And so basically the stars climb up to even brighter positions at the giant branch. So the tip of the giant branch is a clear indicator of energy loss of such a star in terminal axions or, or other, other things. So that's an old argument um, but that has been looked at by, for example, um, uh, this group recently. We'll hear about that much more, I think, in the, in the talk after next. So I'm not mentioning their work in detail. Let me just mention our, our own work uh, briefly, which is the following. The tip of the red giant branch can be looked at in these global clusters, but also in a distant galaxy. But if it looks at that galaxy here in, in, in the star field at the edge of the galaxy, you know, with a lot of old stars, and you look at the luminosity function, you see that as a function of brightness, you run out of stars very quickly. There's this transition between um, a lot of stars and, and not many stars at the tip of the giant branch, of course. And so just look at the luminosity function, and you're seeing several times the same thing with different methods. Doing a statistical analysis, one can pin down the tip of the giant branch very precisely. Uh, and, and, and this feature in the, this discontinuity in the in the luminosity function caused by this discontinuity at the tip of a giant branch has been used to uh, to determine the distance of galaxies and is, is 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 also used to to get information on the cosmic distance ladder. But I mean, this particular galaxy has a water maser in it, which allows one for quasi geometric distance determination and therefore a fairly precise determination of the brightness of the tip of the red giant branch. Um, so, as I was saying earlier, this, I, these ideas are also used to, in the cosmic distance determinations. So, it plays a role in what's called the, the Hubble tension question, where, um, where, where we know that, that these stellar observables like the Cepheids or the TRGB give a different answer for the length scale of the universe or the Hubble constant compared to the C, uh, CMB uh, information together with the cosmic standard model. So there's that Hubble tension, and you see the, T, the TRGB determination of H04 in the middle between the Planck determination and the Cepheids. So it's somewhere in the middle between these two, two cases. But in any event, so I'll, I just mentioned this in passing because I find it very interesting. But, uh, but uh, what, what we have done with, uh, with Francesco, who I think is here today, is to look at these matters in a little bit detail. We looked at the theor theoretical predictions and the error bars, etc. And then comparing the brightness of the TRGV based on uh, based on 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 this um, on this galaxy, we find uh, a, a limit on the axon electron coupling that corresponds to this number here, uh, or or to the true dipole moment, which is by far the most restrictive limit on something like the material dipole moment compared to uh, compared to electron uh, compared to uh, laboratory experiments. But I, I but we'll hear more about this I think in, in Oscar's talk later. Um, there's also been a very recent review on that subject only a few days ago by Jody Eason and collaborators, where they use white dwarfs for similar for similar um, for similar purpose, and they list all sorts of limits from the white, white, white dwarf dwarf observable observables. There are some variable white dwarfs where you might think 
you get actually a, a, an indication for an extra cooling speed. Sometimes some people say, think there's a hint for extra cooling mechanism, but on the other hand, these other limits uh, from the TRGB are so restrictive that one should be skeptical about these, these hints. Um, okay. So, so much for, um, for the white dwarfs. Uh, and let me just mention that, of course, these limits are not just used for axion, they're used for anything these days. Here's a, a, a plot from uh, on, 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 on dark photons, and, and there's, there are these grand unified uh, 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 exclusion limits about dark photons and the kinetic mixing parameter. And of course, for in, in this uh, EV or KV range, these stellar limits are the dominant limits in, in, in this context. So there's another example where these kind of limits have played an important important role. I just mentioned in passing uh, to, to, to just prove that there's more to this than the old ideas about neutrino dipole moments, for example. Okay, let me turn to my final topic, which is supernova neutrinos. So you saw in my early plots this this big uh, this nice picture, the, the Crab Nebula, which is the remnant of the of the supernova of 1054. Um, uh, um, almost a thousand years ago, which was reported in these Chinese records here. It's called the Chinese supernova, sometimes for that reason. And you see it, there's a, this, this big explosion nebula, and in the, in the center, there's like the crab pulsar. So this this uh, this um, compact remnant that one usually gets in supernova, uh, uh, quarter of explosions, is actually collapse of a, of a star, and it gets this, this pulsar in the center, usually. So, so what happens is at the end state of a star, uh, of a massive star, it has all these burning shells, this the giant iron core in the center. And once that has burned out, it cannot ignite a further, a further burning phase. It will collapse to, to form a, a pro-neutral star nuclear density. Uh, at the implosion, it will form a shock wave that drives out the, the stellar envelope. <clears throat> so so the, the bounce shock will drive out the envelope. It has to be read by neutrinos. But in any case, it then will cool by neutrino by neutrino diffusion over a few over a few seconds now today i cannot cover supernova physics that's what we talk in, in its own right but let me just mention of course that this was observed once i mean the neutrinos were observed once in this other historical supernova uh, that happened on the 23rd of february 1987 and uh, where this where the star um minus 6902 in the large imagine a cloud um at, at, at around 160 light years distance from us uh, exploded in a supernova and, and in, in conjunction with that one observed neutrinos about uh, two dozen neutrinos in different detectors that were happened to be active at that time it's a very long time ago um, and so this has confirmed the picture that neutrinos stream out slowly or diffuse out slowly over second time scales from that collapsed supernova core this kind of the only astrophysical environment except the early universe where neutrinos are actually trapped and cannot freely stream. And so if something else freely streams, such as axions or something else, you get this volume emission of these new particles, and they would take away the energy otherwise powering the neutrino burst. And that gives us limits on things like axions and many other particles. It's a very classic argument. Now, as far as axions are concerned, I mean, this is a very, this is a very old story, um, but very recently there's has been a lot of attention by particularly quite a few people in the, in the audience here, I think. Um, and, and so a lot of the focus was actually the nuclear physics of the emission, uh, um, correct, I and mean, the nuclear physics of axial emission is, is not a simple topic and was also observed that this pionic process would be important beside the nuclear branch strong. So I've been at quite a few of works recently on, the, on that subject, although in the end the bounds haven't changed so much. For, so, so for a typical run-of-the-mill axon model, uh, the axon should be lighter than uh, 10, 10, 10 milli electron volts. It's not so different from the original bound. So, so uh, it, it is all very important, but in the end, it has not changed so dramatically. Uh, uh, the, the limits haven't changed that so, so dramatically. So as far as axions are concerned, the, super, the stellar limits are roughly like this on, 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 a, on, a, on a scale where we show the axial mass on one axis or the pitcher quinn scale on the other axis from the plant mass to something very much smaller. Then this entire range up to 10 milli electron volts or so is excluded by various forms of astrophysical bounds. Uh, and you can debate the exact end of that exclusion bar, but roughly like this, that's the picture. On the other hand, for very small axis, for very small masses, there would be super radiance from black holes. I'm not talking about this, but we, we, I think we'll have a talk later in the workshop about this very intriguing subject. And in the middle, we can detect axions, 
got better axons with these um, pulsar conversion effects, which somebody else will talk about. So, so that's what is what we can do for axions by with stars. I mean, of course, there are many many opportunities to take detect dark matter axions in, 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 in experiments, but that's our, not our topic here. And of course, there's YAXO, uh, which in future can detect solar axions. So that's what stars can do for axions. Um, okay, there's another class of arguments that have become popular over the past uh, couple of years. And, and, and the idea now is that we get away from axions directly, which are very stable on, uh, with these small masses. And, and we think of axion like particles and similar things which with the mass and coupling strength are kind of decoupled parameters. And so these, these parts can be heavy enough to have a, a significant two photon decay uh, once they've produced a supernova core. And so if these particles escape from supernova core and they decay into photons afterwards, these photons must go somewhere. And so they can be deposited in the mantle of the, of the star here, or if they live long enough, they escape to beyond that and can be picked up by, uh, by other experiments, for example, by the solar maximum mission in the context of supernova 87A, there was this set this gamma ray satellite up there at that time. It didn't see any excess events, so one can constrain this possibility. Or all the supernova in the universe produce a flux of these particles and therefore decay gamma ray decay photons that can be picked up by again um, gamma, gamma ray satellites. And so the, the, these kind of arguments have been popular recently. Um, so let me show our our recent five cents on that subject, where we um, where we discuss um, with Andrea and, and Eduardo and, and, and Thomas Janka the question of you know if 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 we if we, if we deposit energy in the mantle of of the progenitor star, uh, this energy would show up as explosion energy of the supernova. And so our, our main little point was, if I was to constrain this question, I should look not at a typical supernova explosion, but I should look at those supernova with the smallest explosion energies. And there exist the subluminous, subluminous type 2P, uh, 2 plateau supernova, which have very small luminosities and very small explosion energies, much smaller than the so-called typical value. And so if one uses those examples, the explosion energy is so small that that gives us the most restrictive limit on these kind of energy deposition materials. And plotting this on a, on a plot with the, with the axial mass or the out mass on one plot and the coupling strength of the other, other, other axis, we, we can exclude a rather significant region of, of parameter space compared to other, compared to other arguments. Um, another uh, argument of the same type that we recently put forth is in the context of so-called muonic bosons. So, so this, this, there was this idea uh, in, in the context of the muon magnetic moment anomaly that there could be maybe scalars or particles that couple specifically to, to muons. And so in the supernova core, surprisingly, these could be produced a lot by scalar muons. So there's something which has been overlooked, not overlooked, but not really paid much attention to for a long time is that a supernova core actually has a huge number of muons in it, not just electrons. Uh, the, the muons have a mass of about 100 uh, MeV or so, and the temperature is 30, 30 uh, MeV, so the typical energy is over 100 MeV. So the energy in the supernova core are of that 100 MeV type, and the abundance of muons in the supernova core is almost as large as the, that of electrons, maybe a quarter of that or something, but roughly the same uh, order of magnitude. And so uh, if one uses that, that emission process, then these muons come out of the supernova and then would later decay into two photons through this muon loop. It's unavoidable. And so it's the same kind of argument that I just mentioned for these other ops. Um, and so we looked into this and, um, and produced this gigantic uh, exclusion plot based on a large variety of, of arguments. Um, so on the one hand side, uh, one can get um, exclusion from the diffuse gamma rays from all supernova in the universe from the supernova 87A gamma rays, but on the other hand, from the explosion energy, uh, uh, or also the diffuse gamma rays. And, and, and so if, if this is true, then this G minus two explanation of the, um, of the, uh, of the muon anomaly would be, would be excluded by these arguments. So in, in this parameter region, one, get, one, one gets these, 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 these limits. And so you see that here, the most restrictive limits do not come from the energy loss of supernova 1987A, but from these, uh, from the absence of these of these decay products, these visible these visible particles, these gamma rays. So this is this was just published in PRD. Um, so to come soon to an end, let me just mention uh, again 
this diffuse supernova true background from which some of these limits are, are derived. So the universe is filled with neutrinos from the that are emitted from all core collapse supernova in the universe, and the cumulative flux of that uh, is called the diffuse supernova neutral background, or the decay products of that we used here to constrain these radiative, de radiative decays. So it turns out that actually the, the, the star formation rate was much larger in the past. Um, so as a function of redshift, the star formation rate rises linearly to a factor of 10 almost at redshift of, of 1. But if one plots this as a function of redshift, then you see that most of these supernova come from a redshift of, of around one. That's good to remember. I mean, at, 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 at smaller redshifts closer to us, the star formation rate is smaller, whereas larger redshift you run out of volume because at larger redshifts there's not very much volume of the universe left. And so most of them come from that redshift around one, and they're around around ten, in, in the universe, they're around at around 10 million core collapses have happened per co-moving megaparsec. That's a number that one can maybe remember. And from that, one gets the diffuse supernova neutrino background uh, as an average uh, from all from, from all supernova, all these, of course, these decay photons, if we get these unstable particles out of a supernova. And, um, and so this diffuse supernova neutrino background can be measured, in particular by super-K, a uh, super detector that measures all sorts of other neutrino fluxes. And so on this plot, as a function of energy, we see some predictions by this group on the diffuse supernova background. This is plotted here as a dashed line, the sum of various comp contributions from the collapsed supernova and from the so-called failed supernova with four black holes, which is also an interesting, very interesting contribution. Um, but, but the current limits are a factor, only a factor of a few above those predictions. So it's very clear these should be detected soon. And so this, uh, so returning to, to observable neutrinos um, from the universe, uh, these diffuse supernova neutrinos from all past supernova are probably the next low edge neutrinos to be observed in the, in experimentally. And they should be observed by, by the super Kamiokande detector, which has now been um, upgraded uh, by the scatolinium um, in, in solution, which is a, a, an efficient uh, neutron capture element and so you can capture neutrons that, that, that appear in this inverse beta decay process and so one can get a much better background rejection and a much clearer signal on the other hand the Juno detector which is being built in in, uh, in China which has about the same size or the same mass uh, for this purpose will start taking in 2023 um, and so these two things together should in the course of the next few years a rate of a few events per year begin to detect the diffuse supernova neutrino background. So this is basically a, a, um, a scheduled discovery, um, one, one, one could say. So, but it will take it will take years to get a, a signal to noise that is uh, that is makes it a credible discovery. But once it's been, been detected, of course, will give us a, a better handle on the star formation rate, which is not so certain in the universe, and how many core collapses have there been in the universe, and in that sense, gives gives one a better handle at these also at these limits at exotic particles. But again, so here's a, a, a discovery to be made um, in, the near, in the near future. So let me finish with, with, uh, with a summary on, on what, what one could expect in future, maybe in this field of particles from stars. Of course, there's always room for new ideas. Um, and, and of course, for extension and refinements of, of existing um, arguments and ideas. Uh, the search for solar axions is an important point, I think, because it offers the opportunity for detecting something new. Of course, we don't know if axons exist, if they're dark matter or not, or whatever, but axia, the, the parameter range of axons has not been exhausted experimentally. So there's still uh, various places as dark matter, as solar axions, to, to actually detect them. So which I think is, of course, very important. We don't want to spend uh, many more decades just getting limits on new physics, but we want to, actually, we want to see it, right? Um, and then, of course, there's the search for magnetically covered ops in in, in neutron stars on, on the radio search for atomic matter. Again, these things offer detection opportunities, which I think is, again, uh, very intriguing. And of course, I've been waiting for most of my career for the next galactic supernova. There's a 3% chance every year, but let's see when it happens. Once it happens, it'll provide us with a bonanza of new uh, information for particle and nuclear physics. Uh, a topic I haven't touched even in my talk uh, is the question of 
of collective nutritive flavor evolution in, in a dense environment, uh, which is uh, a field where a huge number of papers are being written. But it's, it's, it's a subject where I think this audience is not so, um, it's for different audience probably. And finally, of course, the diffuse total nutritive background and of course, propagation wave evidence and so on, which is also to be covered in future talks. So, so that's, that's, that's it. And in these days, let me just uh, close with this remark. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Georg, for uh, the amazing review and uh, for uh, the updates. Uh, we have time for uh, several questions. So don't be shy. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, I will. I mean, it's a, it's a bit difficult for me to start with questions because it's a too much, uh, too close collaborator. So you can ask a question anyway. <laughs> you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So. Um, uh, perhaps uh, uh, can you can you comment like briefly uh, because probably you know uh, very well the, the literature. You um, you stress that uh, there uh, that there are of course bounds on the red giants from uh, uh, the from red giants on dark photons uh, as well as uh, others uh, as uh, other stars. Um, did anyone ever uh, do a, a precise study of what kind of bounds one can put on uh, dark photons from uh, from globular clusters, for example, from uh, either globular cluster or red giants? Or uh... let me just see. Uh, let's put back this other uh, plot which you referred to, probably. Yeah, exactly. And. Um, so, uh, so I mean, the, 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 these bounds, red giants here, are exactly the same standard argument. Uh, I mean, I, I think people, uh, you, you get this little uh, new sawtooth saw pattern of these different bounds because uh, one relies on, on, on a resonance phenomenon between, um, uh, between the dark photons and the plasma frequency, which is different in these different systems. Um, but I think this is uh, generic red giant, tip of the red giant branch bound. Um, probably we can make it more precise by a little bit by being very specific, but um, but I mean these bounds are all very similar in the sense that you don't shouldn't carry away too much energy from the tip of the giant branch to avoid the uh, to, to delay the ignition of uh, to, uh, to delay the ignition of um, of helium. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, is a, there is a question by uh, Thomas. Uh, yeah, I hope you, you hear me. Uh, yeah, I hear you. Totally. I switch on my camera as well. Yeah, Georg, thank you for this grand overview. Uh, was certainly very enlightening, and I think you, you presented so many facts that there is uh, little, little points of discussion which one needs to add. Um, uh, but I have a question about one extra source uh, of, uh, let me say, uh, 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 particles which might be useful for uh, making exclusions. Uh, maybe it's not explored enough, or maybe the chances are low. Uh, maybe you can give us a bit of uh, an answer, clues on that. Uh, this is uh, neutron star mergers. Um, I mean, uh, we, we have detected gravitational waves now. We also uh, see the phenomena of kilonovi, which might occur more frequently in the future. And that scenario might also be sensitive to some of the particle physics you mentioned, maybe even in a, in a coupling uh, regime, which cannot be touched by, by other uh, possibilities. Uh, do you have any, any idea, any overview of what has been? No, no, but, but I, 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 the, the, the question, I suppose, is what would be the observable? Um, so I'm not, I mean, many of the things that I've presented use relatively simple observables. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, of relative benign <laughs> phases of evolution. Um, so, if you can point us to um, so if, you know uh, re real killer killer observables in, uh, that one could use, um, then then it would be a um, um, 
Me, I mean, one can think of different uh, uh, aspects, of course, uh, but uh, I, I don't know the coupling uh, parameters and the uh, impact. I mean, people of people have, of course, here. discussed things like if, if there could be an impact on gamma ray bursts, forming gamma ray bursts, yeah. or uh, transferring energy to the yeah. from one region, non local energy transport from one region to another, yeah. in, in also in these emerging neutron stars. Um, right. Right. But um, really credible limits I don't have on my list. Uh, but um, maybe this should be looked into uh, into more detail by, by some of the younger people. <laughs> it could be an interesting topic, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, there has been a recent paper uh, Eduardo pointed out uh, where uh, the the kilonova gamma ray burst signal, gamma ray burst signal, I think, short gamma ray burst signal was used for certain constraints. Is that the first work in that direction? You're right. I mean, gamma rays is one possibility. The other possibility might be that. Uh, uh, the particle energy loss uh, could have a dynamical influence on the system evolution, maybe even on the time scale for black hole formation, which could be relevant. Of course, we don't have enough sources yet, but there may be uh, in 10 years or maybe uh, on, on order of that time scale, there may be enough detections, uh, even of nearby events that we might set constraints. Uh, ring down, for example, the ring down of the gravitational wave signal by extra damping uh, through this particle emission, uh, which would certainly uh, reduce the uh, maybe the duration of a, a ring down signal. Uh, effects like these, I, I think of, and, and I wonder uh, whether there is any interest in this community which uh, gets together here in the workshop. Well, let, let's just keep this as a uh, as idea to, to be pursued, right? Yeah, we have uh, time for uh, another uh, short question, uh, and Sam has uh, uh, raised them. So please. Yeah, thank you, Georg, for the nice talk. Um, you had brought up the tip of the red giant bench in the context of the Hubble tension, and I was wondering if you're aware of any interesting novel physics which could, for example, systematically shift the inferred value of Hubble in the context of these systems, or whether there's some limiting factor that would sort of forbid this. Well, um, so, so in the in, in the um, uh, in, in, in that field, um, for for people uh, doing the um, Hubble tension. Um, of course, they, they don't compare the observed brightness with the theoretical one. They, com they compare the, me the measured brightness of the TRGB in, in different systems. So they use that as a, as a distance indicator. Whereas in, in this part of physics context, of course, we compare the measured brightness with the theoretically, theoretically expected one. So these are one compares different, different, different things. So um, if there were a, 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 a theor theoretical effect such as part losses, which shifts, the TRGB uh, in this context, one wouldn't worry about this too much because you measure anyway against a, um, a against other systems. So it's more a question of the, getting the, the geometry uh, or the distance uh, uh, measured. Um, so I'm not sure if there would be particle physics, physics effects that could uh, affect uh, this Hubble tension aspect of this game, okay. as far as I know. Thanks. If I, if I can add, like there, there has been tentative like in, for example, using Axion like to, you know, kind of like the source would look dimmer, but in, just because some of the photon would have converted into Axion, for example, in magnetic field, right? But as far as I know, like none of this proposal really worked out. Oh, that, that's, that's true, of course, if you, if you misjudge um, the brightness by... Uh, right, exactly. This right. was the first proposal by, I think that... Uh, Chaba Chaki, like that's true. Like, I remember know, that's true. You're right. That, that there was like like that, 15 true. years ago, but it doesn't seem oh, to work. May, really. may, maybe, maybe, but should revisit these arguments uh, in the in the light of the recent developments. Yeah, I think that's also that it was a, a recent paper. We can discuss actually because you, you know we left also half an hour of coffee break, and if you know everyone is around, we can discuss. And I think that there is also Chen soon around in the audience, and I think that he also did something in this direction in one of his recent papers so oh. we can discuss about you, that i mean you, 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 since that hubble tension has become so such a big thing now it's, it's now it's clearly like a five sigma effect or so maybe it's it, maybe it's worth to re return to the subject yeah um, um yeah maybe it's Excellent. smarter ideas okay so uh of course like we can uh, we can continue the discussion during the coffee break uh, but like for the moment let's move on uh, so, so i should stop sharing right Yes, whatever you want.
And uh, let, let me uh, let me be sure that uh, the Minds Institute for uh, Theoretical Physics host uh, uh, can uh, start again with the recording. <laughs>